Did you enjoy Squid Game? Me too, what a great show. And Squid Game taught us loads about leadership. So let's explore five of the leadership lessons that Squid Game can teach us. I'm the boss does not work. Through the whole Squid Game, we see examples of how authority when forced leads to mistrust and betrayal, even though it may seem on the surface that all is well and things are working just fine. We see this a couple of times with player 101, Jang Duk Su, betrayed in the outside world by his soldier when his troubles catch up with him. And then also during the Marbles game, when his supposed ally, player 278, shows his true colours when the pressure is on. Do you think that just because I call you boss means I'm your lackey? That was a key comment. Leading a team by throwing your authority around might get you some short-term results, as it did with this character. And I've seen a number of corporate leaders make great strides in their own careers by displaying their authoritarian side to get results. But ultimately, this kind of I'm the boss approach just doesn't cultivate genuine followers. And when it all hits the fan, you'll find that those so-called followers won't be sticking around very long. And they might even stick the knife in. Money isn't everything. Much of Squid Game is about money. All the participants need money, and they are there in large part due to their inability to create that financially stable lifestyle, sometimes through no fault of their own. The games themselves were set up by player 001, Il Nam, and his colleagues, a set of rich businessmen that accumulated vast wealth but then got really bored quickly and looked for other forms of entertainments to keep themselves occupied. Or we can draw the same parallel to leadership in the workplace. As leaders and people managers, it's certainly really important to ensure that people are well paid and rewarded with other traditional style benefits. But once the money level is satisfied, then there are a whole load of other factors that are absolutely essential to ensuring that people are happy in their work. Rewarding tasks, effective and empathetic management, a culture of trust and a leadership that supports and encourages self-innovation. The freedom to innovate without being thrown under the bus, that psychological safety. Flexibility to work wherever people want and whenever they want. These are just some of the non-monetary requirements that the cream of today's workplace require to be their best selves and absolutely demand. Employee surveys regularly feature non-monetary rewards as key requirements for an engaged workforce or key areas where a company isn't delivering. Overall, money is only a small part of the overall positive employee experience that today's workers require to thrive and excel in their roles. And as leaders, we need to consider the whole and full experience of working for us and our companies. The employee of today and tomorrow demands a whole lot more than just the dollars, or the one in this case. Anonymity creates resentment. Anonymity and the protection of identity is a huge feature of Squid Game. From the anonymous guards, identifiable only by their symbol rank, to the players themselves referred to by number rather than name, Squid Game is all about keeping identities a secret. And what does that do? It breeds resentment, suspicion, conflict and jealousy. From the guards themselves arguing and threatening each other to the formation of cliques and huge level of mistrust amongst the players themselves. In fact, as part of establishing their own defensive teams and protective circles, the establishment of names and personality details plays a key part. Because that's what the players do when they try to get closer to each other. The first question they ask each other is, what's your name? And it goes even further. As Squid Game shows us, anonymity doesn't just breed resentment and confusion, but it creates fear. And it doesn't take very long before that happens. On this channel, we've often talked about how the need for leaders to show their human side, to let the people into their own lives and ensure that their teams know what makes them the people they are, both inside work and outside of work. Showing that you're not some sort of work robot is absolutely vital. That you've got some interests, family, hobbies, achievements outside work, mission, drive, desires. All of this creates an empathetic connection with the people that follow your mission. And if they have that empathetic connection, well, they're bind to your mission even more strongly. So as a leader and a people manager, try and open the door a bit to your own life and let people in. You won't drive people away. You'll draw them into what makes you the person you are. Don't underestimate teamwork and strategy. This is one of my favorite lessons from Squid Game. In game three, the tug of war game, you see the team of some of the main characters, such as Ji Hun and Se Biok, paired up against a team of what seems like younger and stronger people, seemingly unsurmountable odds. On the face of it, their challenge seems insurmountable. And in the elevator, their morale is poor and almost defeatist. And that's until the old man, Il Nam, rallies the troops and comes up with a clear and effective strategy for a victory. And not only that, he breaks it down into phases of play. What to do at the start, how to make progress quickly, and then how to establish momentum and carry on. 
And then when the plan begins to unravel, it's down to another team member, Sang Wu, to propose an idea that the team embraces and implements, which ultimately ensures that they survive. This game has got so many parallels with the world of work. In particular, the effect that a clear and actionable strategy can have on a team. Because when Il Nam begins to outline his plans for success, you can see that it's got an instant galvanizing impact on the rest of the team. And critically, he outlines something they can do immediately. Hold on for the first 10 seconds. And he tells them exactly how to do that. That gives their plan something to get stuck into right at the start. It establishes a sense of confidence and gives the plan momentum. Leaders have got a mission, a plan, a drive towards their, what, what they want to achieve. And that can take loads of time and seem like this massive, insurmountable, multi-year task. But if you break your longer term mission up into achievable chunks, achievable goals and milestones, well that can instantly make the end goal seem a lot more achievable. And then once the team's got some momentum, the confidence can flow. And that's where the winning move comes in. When the plan begins to falter, Sangwoo comes up with a great idea, the rest of the team buys in, and that's what sees them over the line to victory. As leaders, we should never underestimate the value of a motivated and committed team and how that team can get results that would have seemed absolutely impossible at the start. And when leaders can break down their overarching mission into these achievable chunks, then it helps people get on board and get them committed. And once people are committed, that's when other ideas and innovation flow to overcome even the most seemingly impossible challenges. Squid Game is a great example of this. Are you a giver or a taker? Well, one of the most powerful scenes in all of Squid Game is the portrayal of Ali, player 199, by Sangwoo in the Marvels game. To be honest, I'm still not over it. Throughout the series, Ali is shown to be a kind, giving and trusting person who seems to be all out to help other people without any thought of what he can get back from them. You see this when he saves Ji-hun during Red Light, Green Light. He could easily have done nothing and it wouldn't have impacted him at all. Ali also offers food to Sang Woo and is instantly trusting of everybody that he meets. Even Ali's participation in the Squid Game itself is all about helping other people and nothing about self gain. And then it all goes wrong. Brutally betrayed by Sang Woo, Ali can barely even comprehend how he's being treated before he's seemingly executed. We'll see about that in series two. But what's the lesson here? Well, it's a harsh one, I'm afraid. In the workplace, there are three kinds of people. As Adam Grant refers to in his book, Give and Take, there are givers, people that love to help and assist others. There are takers, people that love to take from others and aren't interested in giving. And there are matchers, people that if you help them, they'll help you. Givers tend to go far in companies, provided they show a level of awareness of the sharks that are out to exploit them. I've seen givers just like Ali who fail to realise the darker side of human nature and before they know it, they can't even meet their own work deadlines because they've spent too much time helping other people. They've failed to identify the takers out there and they've been exploited. Successful givers are the ones that are happy to make sacrifices to help other people, but they also have that self-awareness to spot the takers, to spot the sang woos of the workplace and that allows them to protect themselves from exploitation, something that poor Ali failed to do in Squid Game. Let me know what you thought of Ali's situation in the comments. It's definitely one of the best parts of the whole show. It's amazing just how many links into the world of leadership we can see in Squid Game. For more on getting the most out of your teams at work, have a look at this video. I'll see you over there.